He went to um, a party with the Beatles and they were all on various substances and various substances and various substances. And Don't forget we're watching you! And today, we are talking about the legendary Beatles album, Revolver. Revolver is a critical album in the Beatles discography. Where this came from in uh, the Beatles kind of history is um, they had spent about three years being the biggest band in the world. And bigger really than any pop or rock band had ever been in music history. And I don't even think they fully realized what impact they were having on the world. Of course, it was not like time like these days, no internet. <laughs> Every time they went on tour, something kind of crazy would happen at this point. Yeah, when they went to Japan and when they went to the Philippines, Philippines, that was a big deal. They were getting really sick of having this happen to them everywhere they went, and they just wanted to get off of the stage for a while. This is where they took that experimentation to the next level. Next level experimentation. Yeah, kind of. Beatles style psychedelic rock, more doing like experimental with the studio, especially with John and George. John and George doing their thing. Yeah. And their previous album, Rubber Soul, was kind of a step away from rock music, a step away into folk. Yeah. This album went full back into rock music, full back into using electric guitars and the most advanced electronics that they could, along with the psychedelic elements. For a long time, Sgt. Pepper was treated as their best album, but nowadays a lot of people think like Revolver is also one of their best and even better than Sgt. Pepper. Some people yeah, say some like people that. are 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 yeah. opining that their last album recording during the tour era. Sgt. Pepper, they were totally done with touring, so they were just they can spend a lot of time just in the studio, but. Even with this Revolver album, they had to go back to touring right after recording this album, so they had a limited time. During this record session, they also recorded Paperback Writer and Rain too, but those songs were not included in this album, but made it as a single only. And also one noticeable thing is, they used many musicians and their friends. <laughs> Yeah, basically they were calling anybody who they wanted into the studio. So on that note, let's get into the track list of this album. So this album had 14 quality songs. The album starts off with George Harrison having yeah. the first song on the album, and that one was Taxman. The Beatles were already starting to step away just from relationships, and they were starting to write about other things besides, you know boy girl couple things with nowhere man and this album took that one step further literally talking yeah. about ridiculously high tax <laughs> and the government and i'm sure the beatles were basically just losing money left and right because <laughs> yeah. of all the stuff they were making off of their tours you know and i read that uh it was john's idea that literally put real politician's name in the song oh yeah that i don't know how that would have gone under yeah or just... gone over so then we have uh, number two um, on the CD is Eleanor Rigby, which once again, nothing to do with relationships. No, it's talking about loneliness. And then number three, I'm Only Sleeping. You can guess what that's about. And then we have another Harrison track, Love You Too. Here, There, and Everywhere, number five. Number six, the legendary Yellow Submarine. Submarine. Number seven, She Said, She Said, which has a very interesting um, history behind it. It was an actor, Peter Fonda. He went to um, a party with the Beatles, and they were all on various substances, and he crawled up to them and said, I know what it's like to be dead, because he'd been shot, shot. before. <laughs> and George freaked out. John too, of course. Yeah, of course. And that's where the song really started. And next song is Good Day Sunshine. Oh yeah, some of Paul's granny music, as John would call that. Um, being, of course, the uh, first track of the B-side on the original vinyl. And then And Your Bird Can Sing, 
followed by or no one and then dr robert yeah and i want to tell you yeah i want to tell you that's another harrison track which you can tell which one which songs are harrison songs because a lot of them tend to be pretty cloudy especially with this album he was really really into indian music right so even though he's playing electric guitar doing solos it really sounds like indian music and next song is Got to get you into my life. Oh. Basically that song was written by Paul and it is really influenced from Motown music and surprisingly there was other remake of this song by by big band Earth Wind and Fire. Oh yeah of course so they were literally the horn band. Yeah. And then of course Tomorrow Never Knows is the final oh. track of the album and my what a strange track to end this album on that song is just so now that we've gone through all of the tracks of this album let's go ahead and get into our expert picks so for our expert picks on this album i'm going to go ahead and let mr neil go first what is the first track that really stood out to you on this album i want to first pick the most weird song from this album, Tomorrow Never Knows. Oh yes, of course. So what made you pick Tomorrow Never Knows? Honestly, I'm, well, I'm not really into the lyric of this song because obviously this song is about LSD. <laughs> but I really like the sound of that music. It's just... Totally crazy experimental thing going on. I read that they were actually controlling the tape group when they are recording the song and also using back masking tracks, which was also used in Rain and other song, of course, by John. Because he was getting very into abstract music and music concrete and things like that. Yeah, and also they used sitar and tempera and also mellotron and ham on the organ and also there's something funny thing that you can hear some kind of seagull sound but it is not seagull sound what is it it is post laughing <laughs> they take his laughing sound so fast it sounds like seagull sound i wonder what paul was on when he was laughing like a seagull mm, that's my question good one <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, a lot of these songs actually have interesting um, theoretical aspects that go on with them in their composition. Yeah, it has a mode scale feeling. And it is using, basically it is using the Mytholidian and they keep using C major chord. And just for one part, he uses B flat over C bass. And the reason that that happens is because they're using um, an arrangement that is typical of Indian music where they have a drone which uses a single low note throughout the entirety of the song and that low note was C. Yeah, Poe is actually just playing C from beginning to end, just doom, 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 like on and on and on. Guitar or other instruments usually playing C major and then just one part they play B flat but the bassist keep playing C notes so it basically playing B flat over C. Funny thing is, title Tomorrow Never Knows is not in the lyrics and John did not write it even. It was from Ringo. Something Ringo <laughs> said which often, you know, led to lots of titles of Beatles songs including Hard yeah. Day's Night. Anyway, what else stood out to you? What was the other one? I'm gonna pick the second one as Eleanor Rigby. Oh yes, of course. Yeah, it is a beautiful song and it is just beginning with string sessions and there's no Beatles member playing any instrument. I believe it was an octet that was playing. It yes. was not a, a string quartet, it was a string octet. Yeah, the string arrangement was done by George Martin, of course, and he got influenced by movie psycho soundtrack, which was just totally done by string orchestra only. So now, in contrast to what went on in Tomorrow Never Knows' theory, this is actually deceptively simple. Surprisingly, it is quite simple song, based on E minor and C chord. Just two, just two chords. This song also has a mode scale, which is Dorian. I think 
Paul did not write this song like thinking it. I'm gonna use Dorian scale or something like that. I don't think so. He just played with guitar and we can say it is using Dorian mode and like that. Let's hear what you picked from so, this album. So for my first pick, I picked I'm Only Sleeping. It sounds deceptively easy and deceptively simple, but really it's not once you dig deeper into it for lots of different reasons. The first reason is this song is not in any one particular key. It actually hides ambiguously between the relative minor of F sharp major, D sharp minor, and the relative minor of B major, G sharp minor. And also another notable aspect of this is that this also used overdubbing and plentiful backmasking. There was an entire backmasked guitar solo so. that George Harrison played that occurs in the middle of the song and also at the end which really contributes a fantastic, dreamy feeling. And your second pick? My is... second pick, um, actually, um, I kind of have two, but the one I'm going to put in front is And Your Bird Can Sing. Oh. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I know. Most people would say wow, but the reason I picked that is because it sounds surprisingly contemporary, even 50 years later. You can hear a lot of the origins of Britpop and a lot of the origins of really strong guitar-oriented rock due to a duet that was played between George and Paul. It is not one guitar playing two notes. That is George and Paul keeping perfect time, perfect harmony through almost the entire song. Think about how did they uh, record the song. You know, they have to do it live. They cannot make mistakes and they cannot just... They can't just like cut it up on the yeah. computer and drag it back. No, no it happened. I mean, they had to play into each other's faces. And you could just see how crazy talented these guys were to keep perfect time with each other throughout the whole recording. Or if I heard this song uh, and I didn't know it was the Beatles, I could have guessed it was from any decade from the late 60s all the way through the 90s. They were truly ahead of their time once again. Honorable mention would definitely have to go to Yellow Submarine. Submarine. Of course, we both love this song. I mean, everybody loves this song, man. It's just such a catchy thing. And usually Ringo would have one song on every album that he would have lead vocals on, and Ringo did the lead in this one. Basically, Paul, John, they were writing song for Ringo to sing. <laughs> yeah, from because the beginning. <laughs> from the beginning, because while the other Beatles had very large vocal ranges and Ringo was a baritone bass, so he had a much lower, smaller range than a lot of the Beatles. And Yellow Submarine really doesn't go any higher than you know, if my ears aren't deceiving me, a kind of like a C sharp or a D sharp four. Basically you can sing that song too. <laughs> this was also highly experimental. Because yes. of all of the sound effects that were going on. This song has a little bit of progressive rock taste. Like a flavor of a it. A little bit. Because they use so many sound effects and bring many, many people. And right, if you look at the credits list for this song, it's about, you know, a page and a half. I mean, who are some of the people on these credits, man? There's George Martin and... Brian Epstein was yeah, on Brian there, too. On there, too, and Marion. Baseball and one of the uh, members of the Rolling Stones was on it. Yeah, Brian Jones was there. Like we have, but we cannot distinguish which is their voice. Yeah, or like who like did that. what? We really want to see the video recording this song. After. Man, I would pay a lot of money to see oh, videos yeah. of those recording sessions. Though those had to have been off the wall, man. Look at what we have here. Well, we don't have the recording video. <laughs> no, but we do have. Well, it's not even the ne the third next best thing, but it's still a pretty all right movie. We will talk about this DVD, you know, animation by itself. So we'll show you the inside of this DVD later and talk about what the animation is like. Let's go ahead now and take a look at the artwork, which is quite interesting. This is um, an example of where the Beatles album covers were really starting to get more artistically interesting because they started to use drawings and many multiple images of themselves and many different interpretations at the same time. And this artwork was drawn by somebody who had very early influence on them in their careers, Klaus Wormann, which was a uh, German artist that they met during their time in Hamburg in the beginning of the 1960s. They actually lived together. <laughs> yeah, they did. That they did. They called up old Klaus and they said, hey, would you like to make an artwork 
like a cover for us and he said yes and this was the result where you can see it's using mixed media with um pictures of them here in various poses from various um time frames from early on in their career and if you look closely they're inserting the actual Beatles' eyes into the drawings, which is pretty strange. On the CD pressing, they included, of course, uh, who did the lead vocals here, um, and some pictures of all of the members here. Of course, we have, there's Paul right there. We have John, John. and Ringo hanging out. And then we have George here. Pretty simple. And here's a fun little glitch that happened with the CD pressing. I'm going to hold this up in front of the camera for about 10 seconds, and I want you guys to see if you can spot the mistake on this. We're going to let you guys figure this out for yourself. Hope you guys got it. That was a pretty big, uh, pretty big mistake there. He, I remember he showed it to me, and it took me longer than 10 seconds, and I was like, oh my lord, I'm so stupid. <laughs> Yeah, here's the answer. There's no number one track. Yeah, the, where is Taxman? It's not even there. This is not, uh, you know, printed by from EU or America. This is from Korea, so... I don't know, some idiot made a <laughs> mistake here, so whatever. And also, this is their last album cover with a powerful logo on the cover. Yeah, so. right, because pretty soon they were going to launch their own legendary label called Apple Music. Oh, and that's one little tip. Uh, this album was the last album that was purchased by Capitol Records. By Capitol Records. They, they would take that and they would put that across, you know, different releases. And yeah. I believe this one got stuck on, like, some of this content got stuck on here yesterday and today and also yeah. their infamous butcher album go look up the butcher album cover you're gonna have a lot of fun these are capital records releases that my mom in the united states has in her record cabinet that sounds great man yeah it is actually great i wish i had access to that but my arms are not long enough to reach from seoul south korea so um that's another story for another day mm -hmm. the album was released on august 5th 1966 simultaneously in the United Kingdom and in the United States. It stayed at number one on the Billboard Albums chart for six weeks, if I recall correctly, and it was an even bigger hit in the United mm. Kingdom. Rolling Stone, in their list of the 500 greatest albums of all time, named it, of course, as the number three greatest album of all time time which is a pretty high accolade if you ask me of course go listen to the album especially if you're studying music definitely you have to check this album on that note this has been appetite for music once again i'm wes martin near home and please go ahead leave us a comment down below what do you think of revolver what's your favorite song just let us know what you think and yeah. don't forget to like and subscribe and we're signing out